want to talk to you for well. I don't Coming right down. Does she suspect any well, now that she's announced her engagement? Oh, she probably hasn't thought much about it. I'm sure she doesn't suspect it for this afternoon anyway. Shall we hide in there? You know, she only has to come down from the fifth floor. Let's see, are all the gifts on the table there? Yes. All right, well, that's just fine. Now, uh, oh, Janie, you go behind the desk. All right. And the rest of you? Well, go in my bed. All right. All right. Okay. Be sure to give us a cue to come out. Just say, um, Jenny, what a lucky girl you are, and you deserve every bit of it. All right, I will. <laughs> and now scamper. <laughs> and please try not to giggle, or you'll give the whole thing away. Oh, Ginny, come in. I'm glad you got down so quickly. Well, I hurried right down because I wanted to something. Oh, no, I just wanted a chat. You know, when a girl gets herself engaged, all her friends want to know all about it. <laughs> well, there really isn't much to tell. He just said, and I said yes. <laughs> well, you're a very lucky girl, and you certainly deserve every bit of it. Surprise! Congratulations, Jenny. It's wonderful. I want to know everything. What he said and what you said and everything. <laughs> well, well, wait a minute. Suppose we let Ginny look at her presents. After all, that's the main idea of a shower, you know. Oh, I suppose I should be coy and say, oh, you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> but I'm not going to say any such thing. I'll just say thank you and be happy I have such kind and thoughtful friends. And they're all such perfect presents. Every single thing is something that I want. And how did you know that I needed just this frame for John's picture? Simply because I heard you say so at Helen's party last week, silly. <laughs> <laughs> and these combs are wonderful. Am I wearing them right, Mary? Yes, and they're very attractive. Especially for dress-up occasions. Oh, please, let me try them, Jimmy. There. How do you like them on me, Mary? Well, Janie, I, I really don't think they're quite right for you. You know, that smooth upsweep looks much better on a round face. Your hair looks sweet, just soft and fluffy. Oh, dear, hair is such a problem. Oh, I know, dear, but you're not alone. When I go to the schools to give my lectures, so many of the girls ask me what to do with hair. And they write me about it all the time. I didn't know you ran a correspondence course. Well, I don't, but I do like to help the girls with their problems. You see, so often I don't have time to talk to them individually. So I suggest that they write me. And I really enjoy answering their letters. Well then, Mary, will you answer a few questions for me? What can I do to be glamorous? Well, now that's always a popular question <laughs> with the girls. Uh, but tell me, just what is glamour? Well, it's... Well, you know. <laughs> yes, I think I do. As a French chef might say, c'est là qui fait la soupe. In other words, it's the little touch of seasoning that makes the dish just right. Mm -hmm. But suppose you get in too much seasoning. Well, then it's no good. Well, that's right. And it's just the same with glamour. Now, glamour, you know, is... Now, in order for it to be effective, that means that everything else must be right. Glamour and poison charm, too, are all based simply on good grooming. Mary, poison charm are personality traits. What do they have to do with clothes, makeup, and hair? Well, poise, you know, is simply a state of mind. It comes as a result of confidence in the way you look. If you know you look well, your clothes are right, your makeup natural, your hair neat, the assurance of all these things brings with it that elusive poise. So, poise comes from good grooming. And charm. Well, now, charm is the ability to make other people happy and comfortable with you. Now, that means that you must forget yourself and concentrate on putting the other person at ease. Right? right? Right. And I assure you, no woman can do that successfully if she's worried about the way she looks. <laughs> is her lipstick on straight? Uh, has she a run in her stocking? <laughs> or uh, is her hemline even? So you see, good grooming comes right in at the front door again. Why, Mary, I never thought of it that way. What else do you tell these girls? Perhaps we could learn more. Yes, Mary, give. Tell us exactly what you do at those high school lectures. Well, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'll walk across the platform of the high school auditorium. Good morning, girls. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the way you look. 
Now, I've heard it said that we women attach too much importance to our appearance. But that isn't true. After all, the way we look exerts so much influence on the way we feel and on the way other people feel about us that it really is very important. When I talk about good appearance or good grooming or looking your best, you probably think immediately of clothes or hairstyle or makeup. Well, I realize that those things are especially interesting to you, and they are important, and I am going to talk about them. But uh, please remember that they are just really the trimmings. Just like the icing on the cake. If the icing is very good, well, that's fine. But if the cake itself isn't good, you'd soon lose interest in the icing. So let's start with the cake and come back to the trimmings later. Basically, of course, Good health and intelligent physical care are the foundations of all beauty. We all want a lovely skin, shining eyes, a beautiful smile and loads of pep, but we can't have them except in a healthy, clean body. And I mean clean. Remember, you can't have good looks without soap and water. There's no substitute for the daily bath as a groundwork for glamour. Brilliant teeth need brushing. Gleaming hair means frequent and thorough shampooing. And keep that air of freshness by using a deodorant regularly. It's a shortcut to social security. Sleep comes next to cleanliness as a beauty base. And I mean sleep, not just going to bed if that means sitting up writing letters or listening to music. I've seen lots of sparkling eyes and good complexion sacrificed to swing records at bedtime. Mind you, I I'm all for music in its place. But there is a lot of sound sense in that old expression, beauty sleep. So snap out that light early enough every night to get eight or nine hours of this most effective beauty treatment. And then there's this business of eating. It worries me to see that so many girls think a balanced diet consists of soda pop and a sandwich or a big gooey sundae. Let's remember what we were taught in home economics about a well-balanced diet, meat, cheese, eggs or fish, milk, butter, bread, fresh fruits, especially citrus fruits, green and starchy vegetables in proper proportion, and of course some sweets. And please go easy on fried foods. Beautiful skin, vitality, glossy hair, all the things you want begin with a balanced diet. So watch it girls, it pays big dividends. Then there's exercise preferably outdoors. And when I say exercise, many of you may think of work. Well, a little work is a helpful beauty hint, but so is outdoor play. I'll leave it to your own conscience whether you work in the garden, ride a bike, play ball, hike, swim or ski. But try to spend some time every day outdoors, developing the grace that comes from toned up muscles and the complexion that goes with good circulation. And even the ordinary things that you do every day can help to make you more graceful. But not if you do them like this. Walking upstairs, reaching up to a high shelf, dusting, all can be good body conditioning if you use your muscles to do them vigorously instead of slouching through them. I don't know whether you think of posture as a beauty subject, but it is just as much as it is a health subject. So, let's talk about posture for beauty. Believe me, it is important, because regardless of how much or how little money you spend for clothes, they can't do the whole job of making you look your best, unless you give them a certain amount of support. I don't often advise you to take examples from the movies, but just watch any good movie actress for posture. Notice how she walks, goes up and down stairs, sits down and gets up. Why, if her posture weren't perfect, she wouldn't be a movie star. You know, bad posture sort of sneaks up on you when you're not thinking about it. For instance, there's the girl who goes through the halls supporting her books on one hip. She looks like this. <laughs> then there's the stomach carrier. She goes through her school life looking like this. And, of course, there are so many wrong ways of sitting down that I couldn't begin to show you all of them. There's the girl who throws herself at the chair as though she were playing living statues. Then there's the shoulder blade sprawler. 
and the knees apart, pigeon-toed sinker. Now, it's just as easy and a great deal more poised and charming to uh, sit down and get up gracefully, all in one piece. Now, there are a lot of little bad habits that many girls have that detract from poise and charm. I call them meaningless gestures and mannerisms. I'll show you what I mean by turning my back and describing some of the things that I know are going on in this audience right now, even though I can't see them. For instance, I'll bet that right this minute there's a girl out there biting her beads. And another one contentedly munching the paint off a pencil. There are undoubtedly several of you who are playing with your hair, twisting a pet curl round and round and round. And of course, there is the nail biter, the worst of all nervous little habits. If you can't break yourself of this habit, never, never wear a nail polish, because the bright polish will attract attention to your short, ugly nails. But don't go to the other extreme. Nails like claws. Claws are for cats. Well, I can't leave this subject of habits without talking about the good old American habit of chewing gum. Itself. And whatever you do, don't chew with sound effects. <laughs> well, enough about habits, except to this. Be sure you rule your habits. Don't let your habits rule you. And take an inventory every once in a while, just to be on the safe side. Now I know you're all waiting to talk about clothes. Well, I love to talk about them, too. But since I can't give you a whole fashion course right now, I think it would be best to talk about accessories and well-fitted clothes. It makes me think about the best secretaries I ever had. When she came to my apartment for an interview, well, I don't think that most people would have hired her. I did because I thought she had ability, and I knew I could help her with her appearance. She had on a nice tailored suit, but in the most important places, it was a misfit. And no suit shows off to advantage unless the fit is right. First, it fitted badly in the shoulders. There was obviously something the matter with the skirt. And it took me a minute to figure out that it was too long. So she had just rolled it over at the waistline. No skirt will hang right if you adjust its length this way. And an even hemline is a must. Her blouse was much too fussy for a tailored suit, and her hat was all right, but she'd spoiled it by adding a veil. Her bag was much too big for such a small girl, but like so many of us, she either thought she had to carry everything she owned around with her, or she was too lazy to clean it out. Her gloves were much too elaborate, and her shoes, well, they would have been all right for an afternoon dress, but definitely not for this suit. Then, after she'd been with me for a few weeks and asked me a thousand questions, she looked like this. The same suit, but nicely fitted and the shoulders fixed. She carried a smaller bag, suitable for a girl of her size. Now, plain gloves matched her hat. The same hat, but the veil was gone. Her plain pumps were in excellent taste, a good buy because they could be worn with practically everything. And her tailored blouse was perfect. So you can see how important accessories are, and well-fitted clothes, too. Some of you may believe if you had unlimited money for clothes, you'd have nothing to worry about. Well, that just isn't the case. For no matter how much you spend, if you don't take good care of what you have, you won't be well-dressed. I spent a weekend with some friends of mine recently who have two daughters. Their wardrobe is the envy of all their school friends. They don't have a lot of clothes, and what they have are not expensive. But both Ethel and Louise know that a needle and thread, some cleaning fluid, good clothes brush, and an iron are the hidden secrets of keeping well-dressed. They know, too, that either a sagging hem or a gaping seam is a sure way to kill glamour. Both of the girls spend a few minutes each day on their clothes. It doesn't take long because they never let the work pile up until there is a lot to be done. Louise uses a touch of cleaning fluid on the inside of collars, cuffs, and hat bands. Because even if no one else could see it, she could certainly never feel well poised or charming or glamorous if she knew that collars or cuffs were soiled. And both girls know that it saves time and saves clothes 
to get things ready to put on and then put them away neatly where they belong. They spend no time frantically searching for clothes to find them crushed in the corner of a drawer or hanging shapelessly on a hook. It's not the size of the wardrobe that counts, you know, it's the shape. One thing more, the final checkup. See that the hemline is even, the slip where it belongs, the stocking seam straight, and if those shoe heels are run down, get them fixed pronto. Then flip a clothes brush across the shoulders to make doubly sure that there is no loose hair or dandruff, and you're ready to face the outside world. And when you face the outside world, be sure you put your best face forward. Now, occasionally I hear the expression, well, it's the face I was born with and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, that isn't quite true. Any girl can do a lot to get the most out of her looks. The basic requirement is a clear, glowing skin. There's no substitute for that. And since the skin is nourished by the bloodstream, the things that you eat and the exercise you take have a lot to do with the way you look. The most important thing I can tell you about the care of your skin from the outside is keep it clean. For that, you need a cleansing cream and soap and water. Here's how to do a really thorough job of removing makeup. First, pin your hair well back out of the way. And if you wish, cover it with a hand towel. Start to work with a cold cream. Smooth it on thoroughly all over the face Clear up to the hairline and down under the jaw. Give extra attention to the pockets at the base of the nose and the cleft of the chin. Spread the cream on using little spiral motions, always working upward. But please, not too rough. No need to pull or push your face around. It's the gentle massage with the cream that gets results. Now, tissue the cream off with long, thorough sweeps. Switch to a clean spot in the tissue after each sweep so that you don't track the grime right back again. At this point, lots of girls like to rinse with more cold cream to make sure they've removed every bit of stale makeup. You know, in several girls' colleges, they have a course in good grooming for which they give regular college credits. And believe it or not, one full period is devoted to teaching girls how to wash their faces. But you don't need to go to college to learn that. I'd like to give you one hint, though. Don't just slide a washcloth around and call your face clean. Friction is half the battle, and back of your neck and your ears get their share of attention. If an excessively oily skin is your problem, use a liquefying cream as your cleanser. And after removing the cream, dab on a good astringent or skin freshener. Or, if yours is a dry skin, or if your face gets really chapped, finish off with a nice, rich, dry skin cream. One that's homogenized and has plenty of lanolin. Now, if you're off on a date instead of off to bed, makeup comes after cleansing. And I mean after. Never apply new makeup without first removing all of the old. With the help of these two young ladies, I'm going to try to give you a few pointers on applying your makeup. The first step is a smooth base. For that, you can use either a makeup pat or vanishing cream. If the pat is used, you blend it on over your entire face using a damp sponge or cotton. Apply it sparingly. And while still moist, blend it to super smoothness with your fingertips. If, instead of the pat, you use vanishing cream, the light touch is equally important. Put a little on forehead, cheeks and chin, and spread it evenly clear up to the hairline. If you use rouge, try putting it on with the tri-dot system. One dot directly under the pupil of the eye the second on the cheekbone, and the third no lower than the tip of the nose. Now fill in the triangle lightly and blend in carefully until no one can see that the rouge is there, not even you. Nothing dates you as much as rouge that shows. Lipstick is your exclamation point. 
Use it sparingly, but well. Use two strokes to outline the upper lip and one long stroke for the lower. Fill in with up and down strokes so that the lipstick goes with the grain of the skin. Be sure that your lipstick harmonizes with your rouge and your nail polish. And check with any reds in your costume to see that everything is in key. Now after applying your lipstick, blot off the excess with a tissue. Last, your powder. It goes over your makeup, all over your face. Choose the shade carefully. When you find one that blends in with the color of your skin, no lighter, that's your shade. If your skin is on the sallow side, you'll want a powder one note rosier. And please avoid the too powdered look. Use a clean puff or fresh piece of cotton and keep it well filled. Press it lightly all over your face, starting at the forehead and working down. Use a loosely folded tissue to brush excess powder away, giving particular attention to hairline and brows. And before you leave, take a good look at your face. And remember, lots of people will see you in profile. So be sure that the makeup goes all the way around to the sides. Now I know you want me to tell you something about hairstyling. In selecting a hairstyle, remember that your hair is the frame for your face. The ideal facial contour is supposed to be the oval, but some of us have round faces or square faces or long faces. So what can we do to make our faces appear a little more oval? Let's start with round faces. Here's a face that lacks a little in length and has a little too much width for the cheekbones for a good oval. Now let's see what can be done to make it better or worse. First, let's take hair. A feather cut wouldn't be too bad on this face if kept in hand. But an overgrown feather cut gives too much hair at the sides and on the forehead and adds to the effect of roundness. And this is a typical example of how not to wear your lipstick, with emphasis on quantity rather than quality. You never saw a natural mouth like that. One other point for round face. Don't wear too high a neckline or a large bow at the neck. It shortens the neck and increases the effect of roundness. Now let's start over again and see the right way. Here is a very good hairdo for this type of face, with the hair well off the forehead and flat against the temples. The lipstick is applied correctly to follow the natural mouth line. A V-neck completes the picture and gives the impression of a little more neck length to help make round face look oval. You see, there's quite a difference between this and this. Now let's take square face. This face is really very similar to round face, except that it has additional width at the jaw. With such a face, keep away from a hairdo like this, with bangs that take away from the length and hair hanging to the jawline that overemphasize the squareness. And these thin, straight lips emphasize the width of the jaw. And a straight across sweater line just serves to square the whole thing off, which is wrong, of course. Now let's start over and do it right. This hairstyle helps to take away from the shortness of the face and the squareness of the jaw. This girl has thin lips, so she follows the general lip line, but fills out the lower lip slightly with her lipstick. And she wears the same type neckline as round face to give the neck added length. When finished, there's a vast difference between the wrong and the right. The third type of face is that which is long and narrow, and frequently a long neck goes with it. Of course, this hairdo is all wrong, because the hair piled on top of the head adds to the length of the face. And because it's close at the sides, it makes the face appear narrower. This vivid lipstick on thin lips gives the mouth a rather hard look. The wrong effect is completed by a V-neck that again adds to the impression of length. 
The same girl, to make the most of her long face, should wear her hair like this, off the top of the head and fluffed out at the sides for added width. And she may fill out her lips a little if she can do it artistically. A high neckline or choker beads will help to detract from the long neck. So, instead of looking like this, she looks like this. Well, it's nearly time for your next class, so I must stop talking. But there's one more thing that I'd like to say, and that is, don't copy. Not hairstyles or mannerisms or anything else. Not from anybody, in or out of Hollywood. Get ideas from people, certainly. But be sure they're ideas that can be adapted to your own personality. After all, each of you is an original. And an original is always more valuable than a copy, whether it be paintings or hats or girls. And now, before you go, if any of you have any questions that I can answer, just come up on the platform and we'll talk for a few minutes. Or, if you wish, you can write me for any advice on clothes or hair or makeup or any other part of good grooming. I'll answer your questions just as soon as I can. I'd like to speak to you, please, Miss Stuyvesant. Oh, go right ahead. I want you girls to ask me questions. Well, I guess I have what you call the round face. And I wear my hair the way you said I shouldn't. But I don't see how things like that and posture and mannerisms and the other things will make a girl more popular if she's not pretty to begin with. Sometimes I like to shake you girls when you worry so much about being pretty or not being pretty. As though prettiness were a woman's only attraction. If you'd spend just one month doing everything I talked about to make the most of your appearance, you wouldn't need to worry about being pretty or popular. I wish that I could wave a magic wand to show you what the difference would be. Presto, like that. Why, it does work. You will be prettier. You will be more popular. Good grooming will pay dividends to each and every one of you. It will make you more confident and at ease in any situation. Well, call that poise or charm, if you will. It will make you more attractive to the people around you. Call that glam popularity, if you like. Remember, at home, at school, or on a date, any time and every time, appearance counts. Make it count for you by doing your best to look your best. Success today and tomorrow is surer and easier with good grooming.